In this presentation, we are going to examine membrane transport. Lipophilic or nonpolar molecules are transported by simply diffusing through the cell membrane. Uh, it's effectively a dissolving process because cell membrane is nonpolar. Nonpolar molecules effectively dissolve in cell membrane and pass through. On the other hand, ions and polar molecules have to be transported in some way. Cell membrane is impermeable to them. So they diffuse through channels and pumps. Channels and pumps transport ions across the cell membrane, a cell membrane to enable normal cell function. Passive transport occurs down the concentration gradient and active transport utilizes energy to move molecules or ions against the concentration gradient. So pumps are involved in active transport. They may be ATP-driven pumps. They utilize energy such as ATP or maybe some other energy such as light to uh, force thermodynamically unfavorable transport of ions or molecules. That means against a concentration gradient from lower concentration to higher. Uh, there are two types of ATP-driven pumps which undergo a conformational change upon ATP binding and hydrolysis. They are P-type ATP ases and ATP binding cassettes. Another type of pumps are secondary transporters, and secondary transporter utilizes the gradient of one ion to drive the active transport of another. Many transporter proteins are present in cell membranes, and their expression determines which metabolites a cell can import from the environment. This is primary means of controlling metabolism. We will cover pumps a little bit later in this presentation. Now we are going to focus on channels, which are involved in passive transport. So while pumps establish resistant concentration gradient across membranes, specific ion channels allow these ions to flow across membranes down the concentration gradient. So pumps establish concentration gradient, which is thermodynamically unfavorable, and then channels allow ions or molecules to flow down the concentration gradient in thermodynamically favorable direction. Ion channels are highly specific for particular ions. And there are also another type of channels, which are cell-to-cell -cell channels called gap junctions. They allow flow of metabolites or ions between the cells. When it comes to rate of transport, PAMPs transport ions at rates of several thousand ions per second. Channels transport ions more than 10,000 than times faster than PAMPs. Rate of transport of ions through channels are close to those of ions diffusing freely through aqueous solution. And still, channels are highly specific for particular ions. We will examine uh, action of channels, how channels work on example of sodium, calcium, and potassium channels. So we're going to look at action potential and the nerve impulse. A nerve impulse is an, electric, an electrical signal produced by the flow of ions across the plasma membrane of a neuron. Cell interior contains high concentration of potassium ions and low concentration of sodium ions. And that's generated by pump sodium-potassium ATPase, covered later in this presentation. In the resting state, membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts. A nerve impulse or action potential is generated when membrane is depolarized. So, depolarization of membrane beyond the threshold level increases permeability to sodium cations. And that further depolarizes the membrane, generating a positive feedback until about plus 20 millivolts is reached. And in some cases, it could reach up to plus 50 millivolts. That's shown in green. So permeability to sodium cations, shown in green, increases, and so sodium cations rush into the cell. Now, the membrane uh, spontaneously becomes less permeable to sodium and more permeable to potassium. Potassium ions flow out and membrane is 
restored to minus 70 millivolts. And that's shown in red. Sodium channel was the first one to be purified and its structure determined. It is a single protein composed of four internal repeats, and each repeat consists of six segments. Of those six segments, five are hydrophobic, S1, S2, S3, S5, and S6. They are membrane-spanning helices. There is also one hydrophilic S4 segment. In it, every third residue is arginine or lysine, and of course those residues are positively charged. So it is believed that S4 segment acts as voltage sensor. Calcium ion and potassium ion channels are similar to sodium ion channel. Potassium channel is a single unit that is homologous to a single repeat of sodium channel. Four potassium channel subunits form a potassium channel. Some bacterial potassium channels contain only S5 and S6 segments. So S5 and S6 segments form actual pore. Segments S1, S4, S1 to S4 regulate opening of that pore. How a channel works on molecular level, we can examine an example of potassium channel. So a 5-amino acid sequence in the restricted part of the pore functions as selectivity filter for potassium ions. And the sequence is listed here. And it is conserved in different potassium channels. Now, a channel is shown here. Um, so um, peptide carbonyl groups are oriented inside the channel to form ion-dipole interactions with potassium ion. Sodium does not interact very well with those carbonyls. That's because the distance is just right for interaction with larger potassium ion, but not with smaller sodium ion. So sodium ions cannot be dehydrated and cannot pass through the channel. So uh, the way it works is that potassium ion enters potassium channel and it enters uh, the blue uh, the area shaded in blue. Uh, ions in aqueous solution are surrounded by water of hydration. So potassium ion has relatively, is relatively large because it's also surrounded and carries with it water of hydration. And so it passes through initial pore shown in blue and that's selective. It allows potassium ions to pass through that pore carrying its, their water of hydration with them. And then, as they enter part shown in yellow, they have to shed their water of hydration. So they lose their water of hydration, and instead, uh, ion-dipole interactions between potassium cation and water are replaced by ion-dipole interactions between potassium cation and carbonyl groups of the amino acids that are oriented towards its side. They are shown here in red. And as uh, potassium cations one by one pa are passing through the yellow, that narrow yellow pore of the uh, yellow indicated pore of the channel, they, uh, they electrostatically repel each other because they are positively charged and so they push each other through the channel. Here is a more schematic representation of the same process. So in the first illustration, you can see potassium cations, four of them, entering the potassium channel, that uh, first pore, a larger pore shown in blue, and each potassium cation is surrounded by eight molecules of water of hydration, shown here as red uh, sticks. In the next uh, step, one of the potassiums sheds its water of hydration, and uh, those molecules of water of hydration are replaced by potassium carbonyl interactions in the narrow part of the channel in the pore that is selective for potassium. So only potassium has the right size to interact with carbonyl groups on both sides of the pore. Other cations are either too large or too small 
for that interaction. And as potassium cation is repelled by other positively charged potassium cations, it moves up the pore. So as you can see, as second potassium cation sheds its water of hydration, now it's closed, very close to the first uh, potassium ion. They repel each other electrostatically, and so first potassium cation is pushed further into the pore, and then those two are in turn pushed by other incoming potassium cations, and so they keep moving through the pore until finally the first one that has come in leaves the pore and acquires again water of hydration. So that one has passed through the channel, and this process will repeat for all the other potassium cations. And here is a model, an explanation how channels open and close in response to change of membrane potential. So, some sodium and potassium channels are gated by membrane potential. They change conformation to highly conductive form in response to change of voltage across the membrane. Uh, Voltage-gated uh, channels include segments S1 to S4, while the pore itself is formed by S5 and S6. So segments S1 to S4 form, form domains that are called paddles. S4 is the voltage sensor itself. It is lined with positively charged amino acid residues. That's one that is closest to us in this illustration. In the closed state, the paddles are in down position. Upon membrane depolarization, paddles are pulled through the membrane into up position. In this position, they pull the four sides of the base of the pore apart and open the channel. Of course, as uh, voltage changes, channels have to be closed quickly. And actually, pedal itself uh, may not be able to flip quickly enough to close the channel. So sodium and potassium channels undergo inactivation within milliseconds of opening. According to Ball and Chain model, the first 20 amino acid residues of the potassium channel form a cytoplasmic unit, the ball, that is attached to a flexible segment of the polypeptide or the chain. When the channel is closed, the ball rotates freely in aqueous solution. When the channel opens, the ball quickly finds a complementary site in the pore, in the open pore, and occludes or closes it. Basically, it swings and closes it. Thus, the channel is open only for a brief interval before it is inactivated by occlusion. Shortening of the chain speeds inactivation, while lengthening of the chain slows it down. So, how long the channel will be open is controlled by the length and flexibility of that chain or the tether. We will examine ligand-gated ion channels on example of acetylcholine and nerve impulses. Nerve impulses are communicated across synapses by neurotransmitters. There are a number of different neurotransmitters, actually not that many of them, uh, but there are some, there are several, and one example is acetylcholine. It's derivative of choline. We encountered choline molecule earlier in this course. Acetylcholine is choline where hydroxyl group has been acetylated. Presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes are separated by a synaptic, a synaptic cleft, and that's a gap of about 50 nanometers. Upon arrival of nerve impulse at the end of an axon, contents of, contents of about 300 vesicles of acetylcholine are exported into the cleft. The binding of acetylcholine to the postsynaptic membrane changes its ionic permeability, and that triggers an action potential. Acetylcholine opens a single type of cation channel, the acetylcholine receptor, which is almost equally permeable to sodium and potassium. Acetylcholine receptor is a ligand-gated channel. Such channel is gated not by voltage, but by the presence of a specific ligands. The binding of acetylcholine to the channel causes its transient opening. The binding of acetylcholine to the extracellular domain of the receptor 
causes rotation of alpha helix rods of the membrane spanning segments, and that makes polar larger and more polar as rotation moves polar sides, polar side chains into the pore. And then wider, more polar pore is open to passage of sodium and potassium ions. Now we are going to look at active transport or pumps. So pumps transport a particular species, typically an ion or some other small, small species like a molecule, against a concentration gradient. And in a general simple scheme, uh, pump interconverts uh, to two conformational states, each with binding site accessible to different side, side of the membrane. And that's associated with consumption of energy in some ways. Some pumps use one concentration gradient to power formation of another. A thermodynamically unfavorable flow of one species of ions or molecules up a concentration gradient is coupled to a thermodynamically favorable flow of different species down a concentration gradient. So overall process is thermodynamically favorable. Such pumps are secondary transporters or co-transporters. The ions and molecules that flow down a concentration gradient are primary transporters, and the transport that depends on that ion gradient is a secondary transport. Secondary transporters are ancient and are common to eukaryotes, bacteria, and archaea. They are classified as uniporters. Uniporters are able to transport specific species in either direction governed by the concentration of that species on either side of the membrane. Symporters use flow of one species to drive the flow of another in the same direction across the membrane. And finally, antiporters couple the down downhill flow of one species, that means down the concentration gradient, to the uphill flow, that means against the concentration gradient, of another species in opposite direction across the membrane. One well-known example of a pump is sodium-potassium ATPase or sodium pump. Most cell cells maintain high potassium and low sodium concentration relative to the external medium. These ionic gradients are generated by sodium-potassium ATPase or sodium pump. Maintenance of these gradients takes up anywhere from 20% to 40% of total metabolic energy and up to 70% of total metabolic energy in neural tissue. Sodium pump pumps three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell for each hydrolyzed ATP molecule. Sodium pump has two conformations, E1 and E2. E1 has high affinity for sodium and ATP. The pump is first phosphorylated to give E1 uh, phosphorylated form of E1 conformation. Phosphorylated pump undergoes conformational change to E2P uh, or phosphorylated E2 conformation, which has high affinity for potassium but low affinity for sodium. Three sodium ions are released to the outside of the cell and two, pot two potassium ions from the outside bind to the transporter. Dephosphorylation causes the enzyme to return to E1 conformation, which has low affinity for potassium. Binding to ATP with a low affinity favors conformation change from E2 to E1. Potassium ions are released to the inside of the cell and the cycle can resume. The net ion movement is one positive charge per cycle. Cardiac glycosides bind to the extracellular surface of sodium-potassium ATPase in its, in its E2P state to form a very stable complex. As a result, dephosphorylation of E2P form is blocked. Cardiac glycosides have been used since ancient times as arrow poisons and in more modern times as heart medications. But they suffer from low therapeutic index which means that lethal dose is close to a therapeutic dose. 
or in more modern terms, toxic dose is close to therapeutic dose. Compared to other steroids, cardiac glycosides are easy to recognize because they are characterized by CD cis-fused rings. So C and D rings are cis-fused, while in the other uh, steroids they are transfused. Also, they have hydroxyl substituent at the fusion point, and they have lactone side chain. They are protective chemicals because they are so toxic, and so they are found in some plants. They are called cardinolides, and they are also found in skin of some toads, uh, buffer toads. They are called buffodianolides. So that's what makes, in part, uh, those toads toxic. An example of cardinolide is digitoxic genin, and uh, bufodianolide is helebringenin. Uh, while they are highly toxic, they usually act as antifeedants because they have extremely unpleasant taste. Imperators usually spit that stuff out rather than consuming it. But, uh, for example, buffer toads can harm small predators like small dog or small kitten. Uh, in living organisms, uh, uh, cardiac glycosides are bound to monosaccharides. So steroid is bound to monosaccharide. That's why they are called glycosides. A hydroxyl group at carbon-3 forms a glycoside bond, and different cardiac glycosides are bonded to different monosaccharides. Oleantrin and, and uh, ubine uh, are shown bonded to adhere to their respective glycoside units. Usually, monosaccharide is modified in some way, so oleantrin is attached to methylated dideoxyarabinos, while ubine is bonded to ramanose. Uh, oleandrin is cardiac glycoside that makes oleander plant uh, and all of its constituents toxic. Uh, it's proposed as treatment for COVID-19, but there is no evidence that it is effective, and at present there, is no, there are no medical uses for it. Obine, babine is uh, obtained from African plant and is used as an arrow poison. It has medicinal use in treatment of hypotension and arrhythmia, and again it acts as by like other cardiac glycosides by inhibiting sodium potassium ATPase. ABC transporter is another type of ATP dependent pump, pump that utilizes ATP to accomplish its role. It has been observed that tumor cells develop resistance to a drug that was initially very toxic to the cell. And development of resistance to one drug also makes tumor cells less sensitive to other drugs, so the cell has developed a multidrug resistance. Onset of multidrug resistance correlates with expression and activity of an ATP-dependent pump that extrudes or expels a range of small molecules from the cell. The protein is called multidrug resistance, MDR protein, or P-glycoprotein. Uh, that's how eukaryotic ABC transporters usually operate. They generally export molecules from inside the cell out. Now, prokaryotic ABC transporters often import molecules from outside of the cell in. Each MDR protein has four domains. Uh, two transmembrane domains, shown in yellow, and two ATP binding domains, called ATP binding cassettes, ABCs, shown in blue. ABCs are homologous to domains in a large family of transport proteins of bacteria and archaea. Prokaryotic ABC transporters are often composed of multiple subunits of a single protein. E. coli has 79 ABC transporters. Human genome has over 150. And here is the mechanism of action of a typical ABC transporter. So, first step involves opening of the channel towards the inside of the cell. Substrate, shown as small red molecule, binds to the, um, to the transmembrane units and causes conf uh, conformational change of the ATP binding cassettes. ATP binding cassettes undergo further conformational changes and bind to ATP. So binding to ATP results in further conformational 
changes. Then membrane binding domains separate and release substrate to the other side of the membrane and at the same time hydrolysis of ATP occurs which resets transporter to its initial state and now it's ready for another cycle. And finally another type of channels that connect cells are cap junctions. They are very different from ion channels. Ion channels have narrow pores and are selective to the ions that they allow to pass through. They are closed in the rest state and have short lifetimes in open state. Gap junctions are cell-to-cell -cell channels. They are passageways between the contiguous or neighboring cells. They are clustered in discrete regions of the plasma membrane. Gap junction typically has rather large central hole and that's about 20 angstroms in size. The channel spans the intervening space or gaps between opposed cells, neighboring cells, and the width of the gap is about 35 angstroms. Small molecules can pass through gap junctions, but large ones cannot. So inorganic ions, monosaccharides, amino acids, and nucleotides can pass through the gap junction, while larger molecules such as proteins, nucleic acids, and polysaccharides cannot. As general rule, all polar molecules with mass of up to one kilodaltons, in other words, mass of up to 1000, can pass through gap junction. Gap junctions are important for intra intercellular communication, communication between different cells. For example, in heart muscle, flow of ions through gap junctions ensures rapid and synchronous, synchronous response to stimuli. Gap junctions are also essential for nourishment of cells that are distant from blood vessels, such as lens cells and bone cells. Gap junctions are made of 12 molecules of connexin, a transmembrane protein with mass from 30 to 42 kilodaltons. Each connexin molecule has four membrane spanning alpha helices. Six connexin molecules are hexagonally arranged to form half a channel, connexon or hemi channel. Two connexons join end to end in the intercellular space to form a gap junction. Gap junctions are different from other membrane channels in that they traverse two membranes rather than just one, and they connect cytoplasm of one cell to cytoplasm of another cell, rather than connecting extracellular space or the lumen of an organelle. Connections forming a channel are synthesized by different cells. Gap junctions form readily when cells are brought together. Once formed, they tend to remain open from seconds to minutes. They are closed by high concentrations of calcium ions and by low pH. And that's an indication that the cell is traumatized or dying. Uh, gap junctions are also controlled by membrane potential and by hormone-induced phosphorylation. And this completes our presentation on membrane transport.